Welcome back, everybody. Hello, hello. So I'm so glad that you're here to join us for the final roundtable of the day, Tales of Three Dishes, where each of the panelists will explore the personal stories behind a chosen dish. Um, as always, two ways to ask questions towards the end, tweet, hashtag Smithsonian food, or write it down and pass it to the ushers. Um, our moderator is Simon Majumdar. Simon is an author, food, and travel writer, and broadcaster. Simon? Thank you very much. Uh, we, we are actually missing one of our panelists, so if someone wants to bring me the head of Alfredo Solis, <laughs> I'd be very grateful. New dish. <laughs> New In dish. A dish. We have created a, a dish here. Well, we are, um, I don't know about everyone else, but watching these incredible panels today, I'm suffering from great imposter syndrome. I'm expecting someone to tap me on the shoulder and tell me I shouldn't be here. But luckily, I am joined on stage by two, I hope they'll forgive me for saying, culinary juggernauts, who I know will <laughs> be able right. to share amazing stories. I hope they will forgive me for praising um, their achievements so savagely. But if I was to read through everything that they have achieved, we'd have to go straight into the question and answer. And I know you want to hear them talk. But uh, nearest to me, Joe Nathan, is a James Beard winning award, yeah, award winning author. Her latest work, King Solomon's Table, a culinary explanation of Jewish cooking from around the world. And she's a regular contributor to the New York Times, Tablet Magazine, PBS NewsHour, and dozens of other things. So we're very, very, very blessed to have you with us today. And Jessica Harris is the author, editor, and translator of 18 books, including 12 cookbooks, uh, documenting the food and foodways of the African diaspora. She has lectured widely in the United States and abroad and has written extensively for scholarly and popular publications. And her latest book, I believe you'll tell, is a move away from more recipes into memoir traditions and is called My Soul Looks Back, a memoir. So we're very fortunate to have them here. Um, I, to introduce this, last night I was doing an event at uh, Princeton and I was asked a question, which is the kind of stock question for bored or lazy journalists, which is, if you were going to be executed tomorrow, what would your last meal be? Um, yeah, journalists out there, and you're all looking down at the ground right now, because you've all done it. Now, apart from wondering why they all want to see me executed, which is, which is a different thing, uh, I thought about my answer, which was fish and chips. And they often go, well, you're lucky enough in your jobs on Food Network or whatever to be offered the greatest food by some of the greatest chefs in the world. Why fish and chips? And I rationalized it. And it fits in very much with what we're talking about today. It fits in with identity, both from a personal sense, because fish and chips is what I grew up eating uh, as a child with my parents in Yorkshire in England. It has that kind of Proustian relationship that I remember times and places and emotions and uh, it's very much a sense of time and place. But I think it also has a cultural importance, fish and chips, because it's very, almost as British as fish and chips. <laughs> and it's one of the dishes that Winston Churchill refused to have rationed during the Second World War. He called it the two lovely companions and saw it very much as an identification of British life. And so I think that's what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about dishes that have both a cultural identity and a story, but also, as uh, our panel will share, they're going to have uh, a personal significance. So I'm going to ask you both to introduce the dishes that you're going to talk about, and then we're going to try and set a, a kind of outline for it, although I think you're perfectly capable of defining how you want to talk about them yourselves, but to give a definition of them, and if there's any interesting etymology where they come from that has relevance, and talk about their early roots, but more importantly, I think, to talk about why they have significance for you and the cultures of which you have great passion. So, Joe, perhaps you would start and, and introduce the dish that you're going to talk to everybody about. Okay. Well, this is Paula Johnson's idea. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm going to talk about a, a dish that's either called hamim or cholent, and it's a, 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 a dish that religious Jews eat once a week maybe not always in the summer. It's a hot dish. It's one for the Sabbath. You start it when the, um, in the afternoon of, the, of Friday, and it cooks all night, and you eat it for lunch. It's based on a very old dish that everybody ate, not just Jews. But because in the fourth century, in the Mishnah, 
the, the rabbis wrote about Jews eating a dish called hamim, meaning hot. Um, they took it for the Sabbath because they would put in it some sort of meat, uh, mostly at that time either lamb or um, either sheep or lamb. Um, they would put in a grain, it could be bulgur at that time. Um, they would also do a bean, of course at that time it would either be fava beans or they would use chickpeas or maybe lentils and they would cook it overnight um, in the hot fire that became coals. Oh, they'd also put eggs in the stew or I, I, I was in a Palestinian village um, in, in Israel a few weeks ago and they had in the coals, leftover coals, the eggs that had been cooking overnight. So it might have been in the coals too. But these were, these were what everybody ate in the Middle East. First they were in copper, uh, excuse me, clay pots, then they were in iron pots, and of course, eventually, they became um, le creuset. Uh, <laughs> and in America, <coughs> there was a Lithuanian Jew who felt his mother worked too hard cooking this dish overnight, and he invented the crock pot. So the crock pot <laughs> is what people very often use today. But should I keep going? Oh, I okay. keep going as long as you like. We've got. <laughs> I'd love to hear more of, uh, of that definition, but perhaps we will, perhaps... Uh, and then I can go back to you it. You would go, just like to introduce your dish right. and tell us about it, and then I'll introduce more about what I'm going to do as well, and then we can talk about some depth about their histories. Okay. Okay. Um, whoa, I'm loud. I'm going to... <laughs> unusual. Not. Um, I guess I wanted to start by saying a chacun sa madeleine. You know, everyone has a madeleine. For me, one of the touchstone dishes was um, Chebujen. Oh, cool. Chebujen is the national dish of Senegal. It is fish and red rice. Mm. And it is interesting because it has made an entire journey, a circuit that takes it down the African coast, probably first to arguably going from French-speaking Africa or former French-speaking Africa into um, English-speaking Africa to Ghana, to Nigeria, where it becomes jollof rice. Now, everybody, uh-huh, there you go. <laughs> and I know you just had a jollof rice festival in DC. So the jollof rice takes its name from the jollof empire. And the jollof or wolof empire existed between 1350 and 1549 AD in Senegal, along the edge of Senegal. So it takes its place of origin with it, although most people have forgotten the Jolof, except they forget that in Senegal, the main language is, in fact, to this day, Wolof. So then that rice then, of course, comes across the Atlantic. As Tony so eloquently said earlier, in the holds, those fetid holds of those ships, in the you know, heads, hearts, and mouths of the enslaved. And it comes to the American coast, and we see it turn up in all sorts of ways, ranging from um, Charleston's red rice. If you've ever eaten in Charleston, South Carolina, and had red rice, that's pretty much it. And then you go down a little bit further into Savannah, Georgia, where it has the very non-PC name in an early cookbook of mulatto rice telling you something about the people who are cooking it, as well as perhaps something about what its coloration is. And then all the way down to Louisiana, where you get jambalaya. So that's the origins of, and when you follow those routes, and it's interesting that you talk about Thierbougen, and you know, I've been fortunate enough to eat that. And it's also a very communal dish. Absolutely. I remember eating it in a courtyard in Rufisk from a communal plate. And one of the things I remember, and I talk about it in my book, Eat My Globe, that they, were, they would keep pushing the best pieces of fish to my side of the communal plate that with the best of the their spoon. That is the mother of the house's job, is to make sure you, um, in Senegal you eat in a communal bowl, and you, you eat very specifically in the triangle that faces you with your right hand. I don't care how left-handed you are, <laughs> eat with your right hand. Um, and you don't <laughs> reach for, oh, that looks nice. You stay in your, stay in your lane. <laughs> you know, stay, stay in your lane. 
And, um, and it is mama's job to make sure that the tastiest bits are in your lane if you are the And they were guest. pushed there. And the other thing was the pe hot peppers mm -hmm. that they would, rather than eat, they would press so mm -hmm. that the oils ran into the rice. And it's something that I've taken into my own cooking now. And so those oils ran into the rice. The other thing is um, not necessarily healthy, but it is a good chebujin if when you eat with your hands, if you eat it, it should dribble oil. Uh, it needs to be oily. <laughs> well, so it's like mm, being in you, you getting your hands yeah, messy. Is, is you know, definitely. So let's let's talk about I know we've talked about this before we came out, but share with everyone recipes. And and one of the things that I sort of asked you in advance was let's talk about uh, the origins of these recipes, the earliest written recipes, but I'm guessing in both cases here when we're talking about oral traditions rather than written traditions. So when did we first have any evidence of those, I'm guessing in songs or stories, but then when did they start becoming written recipes? Well, there are many different levels of that. First of all, um, the fact that it was written in the Mishnah, fourth century, we know that this hamim existed. Um, later on, it became, uh, and with the twists and turns of Jewish history, it moved around. So it started out in the Middle East as Hamim, and then when Jews went to Babylonia, they added different ingredients, and um, went to Egypt, went to Rome after the destruction of the Second Temple, and then they moved up. It became Cholent, war, which, which meant warm and slow, Cholent, but it also became Dafina in Morocco, which meant covered. So you find it in different places wherever the Jews went. We find written recipes for it, again, fourth century. Um, but also uh, in the Geniza, they mention it, which is, means a treasure trove. And these were found in um, synagogues in Cairo. I just found one in the south of France with papers with the mention of God. There were uh, Genizas in Arabic, in, I mean, for uh, uh, Muslims and for Christians. And they were found, that we found them in temples. And they sometimes had not necessarily recipes, but they'd have either on lamb skin or sheep skin or later paper ingredients that you had to go shopping for. Because you couldn't, yeah. you know, people, that's a lot of write, written recipes were at the begin, beginning shopping lists. And, um, and as you know, I, I think of a, the definition of Jewish food is the dietary laws. The second is this obsession with food to conform with the dietary laws. So Jews are always looking for food everywhere. <laughs> and the third is the adaptation because Jews, just the way that the Africans were, were always moving. So they'd have to find ingredients that would help them. So what's so what I find so fascinating about this dish, just the way you do about yours, is that Jews, wherever you go, there's something else put in it. For example, you might find sweet potatoes, or potatoes in Russia, or um, rice, or I don't know, different kinds of beans. It just depends on what ingredients you learned about. So the, you know, the first real recipes um, weren't until like the 16th, 17th century, and a lot of them were in German cookbooks eventually. Why was that? Why would they particularly just be in the German cookbooks? Well, because there are a lot of German cookbooks in the 18th and 19th century. So there are a lot of recipes, but those recipes, I don't believe, came from Germany originally. I think they came from Eastern Europe that had been, originally came from France or from Spain or from wherever, and then they moved east. Then they became, um, and then they used what ingredients they had so that in the 19th century or the late 18th century, they had potatoes all the time, let's say in Lithuania. Then they came back to Germany with Eastern European Jews. German Jews or Alsatian Jews did not necessarily eat Schollent. Um, a lot of the Alsatian Jews were cow, cow dealers. They knew they had to have a Sabbath dish, so they'd have pot au feu, just like a really good Alsatian Jew would have. I mean, an Alsatian. Or sometimes in the winter, they would eat um, choucroute garni, and there was something that I read about those stinky dishes that the Jews eat um, <laughs> in, in Alsace. But Cholent 
it moved around. It was sometimes with meat, it's sometimes with just beans. Um, but I don't believe that, it, that it's really started, that there was a, in, in Germany, that there was a, 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 a that, that people used it as much as they did Eastern Europe and then came back. Wow. Okay, well, Joan. <laughs> Jessica you and were, I are friends, so. Yeah. <laughs> you are people of the book. <laughs> We are people of the word, <laughs> okay? So what happened with us as people of the word is, ain't no recipe, <laughs> okay? Right. You know, it, uh, it is an oral tradition. It gets passed down, usually from the mouth of the elder to the ear of the younger, which Absolutely. is the classic transmission for oral tradition. But specifically in West Africa, and we talked about er this earlier, and in now the Malinke mm -hmm. traditions, um, there are people who are the repositories of history, and they are known as the Gewel. And the French have uh, Francisized, Gallicized, if you will, the word Gewel into Griot. Yeah. And so the Griot are the, um, are the keepers of the history. They are the ones who usually musically can tell you lineage, they can tell you history, they can tell you um, recipe, because it's all, it's all sung. And they usually sing with a kora, which is, I think, a 32 string, I've forgotten the number of strings, instrument with a calabash resonator. And it's very harp-like. And they'll sing the history, but there's always a side note in the year of the flood when they were growing this at the time of that. So, so it gives it a so context. Forth. So it's a context that if you go back and look, you can almost date. So you've got the history, but that's actually how Alex Haley found roots. That's how he made the connection by talking to a girl. But with all of that, as people of the word, the recipe is oral. The recipe is family. Uh, so many African Americans today, you know, I you know, asked my mother, well, watch me. <laughs> okay, I'll watch you. And then it's like, how much was that? That much. You know, it's, it's all very, I don't want to, what would be the word? I don't want to diminish it at all by saying that much may be intuitive. But I think traditionally we cook with our mouths. Mm -hmm. And we've been talking earlier about grains and about ingredients. And that cooking with your mouth is knowing that this salt may not be the same salt as that salt. So the, you know, Martin salt has a different taste from diamond crystal, which, you know, and if you start using the pink Himalayan, you got something else. Yeah. So it's all of those differences that then come into play and then, then that are validated in a way by saying that you cook with your mouth, that you cook tasting, and that's, it's interesting when you say that because, you know, again, having been taught by my grandmother, who's a Bengali, a rather tiny Bengali woman, and she, when she taught me to cook by watching, and she, I would say how much, and she would say ektu, which is the Bengali word for little. Well, her idea of a little <laughs> being this tall and my idea of a little in a palmful was something very different, and so my food will never taste quite the same. But the question then arises, at some point in history, someone decided to commit these recipes to paper. Although I, I'm a great fan now, and she'll be singing my recipes in future on YouTube <laughs> to there everybody. You um, we'll get you a call. We, I, we, we, I shall be playing. But, uh, but at some point, these are committed to uh, paper. Mm -hmm. and, and I'd love to know why you think that happened, and which could be a change in society, the way it changed in working patterns, for all kinds of reasons. And what the reaction to that would have been, because once you commit something to paper, you're giving that recipe at that point an authenticity. When you're saying beforehand, it could have been very, very different. So I'd love to know what you think about how that, how that changed the view of these, these dishes that had taken on lots of faces before. Well, I think that even if they were written down in recipe books, believe me, those 19th century, 18th century, seven, they're not real recipes the way we do recipes. And I also think that, I mean, she's right, that we might be the people of the book. However, um, every single person who's in the kitchen cooks differently. And so that the recipe of, let's say, a cholent 
is not one that you would see necessarily in a cookbook when it became Chollen. Um, and there's no real recipe for it. I'm, as, I'm, you know, you just put all these things together with beans and, um, and rice or whatever. Um, I, I know this one woman who says that she's descended from King David, and her, her recipe has been started in, on one side of her family in Poland, the other side of the family um, in the Balkans. This is early, late history. And um, she added eggplant because her father liked eggplant. She adds hot dogs because her kids <laughs> like hot dogs. And then they always put in something called kishka, which is kishk, which means um, uh, it was uh, uh, what it, it's like a, um, a, a an ingredient that makes everything taste better, and that <laughs> goes way, 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 way back, and um, and you just throw it in there. It's fat, <laughs> it's onions, <laughs> and it goes Except in. That's rather good. It is. It's delicious. <laughs> but the point is, everybody has a recipe from their family and from watching their mother until right now. I, I really believe it, that we now, because of YouTube and everything else and from uh, the, you know, the Food Network, we have Sorry. all these recipes that we can <laughs> see. Um, and so it, it becomes defined more, much more. And, and it's really in the late, like I, I think 1846 was the first recipe, in, a kosher recipe right. in English. And you know that one is a very vague recipe for for Charlotte. Very very vague. The 1840s then were a big. So just to return to to my dish, and it's interesting the religious connection, obviously the connection to the Jewish community. Fish and chips is the story of religious intolerance, um, which people often don't know that fish and chips was really created because of the expulsion of Portuguese Jews from Lisbon in the late 1700s and the expulsion of Belgian Huguenots, I believe, to London from, uh, you know, from Brussels and wherever into London. And uh, they met in the east end of London where I still have an apartment and each sold their dish separately on carts. And Thomas Jefferson talks about fish being fried in the Jewish style in London. And if you read Oliver Twist, Charles Dickens talks about fat, uh, potatoes being fried in horse fat. And in the same area of London, a very tolerant community and still is to an extent, um, they intermarried, and so in, I think, 1860, or in the 1840s, in fact, we're talking, Joseph Malin opened uh, a fish frying shop, and his wife sold potatoes in the front, his Belgian wife, and that was the beginning of the first fish and chip shop. So that connection with religion, I think, is very important, and was there, I mean, would there be a religious connection with, with this dish, or was this just a communal I dish? Think it, well, I mean, religion is just a part of daily life. Uh, what most people don't realize that Senegal, certainly when I was going, was 80% Muslim. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, you wake up with the moisine, you, 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 you live a life that is rhythmed by religion. And so it's certainly a part of the, the, the feasting, if you will. Like and this is, a, this is a dish of feasting. But we started out by talking about recipe. Mm -hmm. And while you were talking about the 1840s, this probably first appears as a written recipe, as a written recipe in French, not in Wolof, mm -hmm. in the 1960s. Yeah. Yes. So it's full 100 years mm -hmm. later. And it was you know, the first Senegalese cookbook, if you will, certainly the first one in French was something called La Cuisine Senegalaise by a lady named Monique Biards, who was the wife of a newspaper publisher, a mm -hmm. colonial newspaper publisher, who codified some of the oral recipes. And this codification is something that I find very, very interesting. In terms of once it moved to the United States and became jambalaya, is when did that begin to be codified? Because that's another dish that's very that alters whenever you try it. And can you, I'd love, can you define jambalaya? I think, and it's an interesting no. question. So because <laughs> I, Your jambalaya is going to be different from her jambalaya. Because you, do, you see it a lot. And I'm really interested in this notion that people are looking at right now for definition. Well, it's not X. 
and we're trying to place an authenticity on stuff and say it's this. And I get it with fish and chips, and I got into trouble for triple cooking chips with my, like Heston Blumenthal with my fish and chips. And people thought that I'd been killing babies on you know, live <laughs> stage or something. And um, so I'd, I'd love to know that codification where it, where it is, is of value and where it's not of value. Well, there, there is, if you go online to the dreaded Wikipedia, <laughs> um, you can find all sorts of things about jambalaya, not the least of which is it is of French and Spanish origin. Well, maybe. Um, <laughs> and there is a Cajun jambalaya and a Creole jambalaya, undoubtedly. Um, it is a reddened rice they said something to the effect of um, the tomato is, if tomatoes are used, uh, replaces saffron, possibly. Nobody has thought about red palm oil. Hmm. Nobody has thought about that dende that they use yeah. in Brazil that certainly yeah. reddens and gives you that exact same reddish orange that is the color that tomato puts now in the chebujen. You know, what did they use in chebujen before they made, before they had tomato paste? And that's all sorts of questions come up. Was it red palm oil? The tomatoes are not native to the African continent, so at some point it was made with something else. Yep. Um, so you've got all of those kinds of things that obtain. Um, the jambalaya, the etymology is confusing, let's just <laughs> say that. Um, it appears apparently in some Provençal cookbooks early. Um, but, um, but what is that? And it's also <coughs> sometimes, and this is where it really gets to be cute, fun, and sticky, and you kind of like to go play in the dirt, is um, they say the jambalaya <laughs> was a way of cooking paella. Gosh. <laughs> okay, that saffron rice, that chicken, that sausage. So it would have its connection with pilau, Could. pilaf. Well, yes and no, because one of the things that always ticks me off is how little we know about history. Let us not forget. <laughs> You, point, you pointed at me when no, you said that. No, that was a general point. That was a, that was a general Thank point. <laughs> we tend to forget that for 700 years, Spain belonged to the Moors. Yes. Mm -hmm. Those Moors came from North Africa. I mean, more people have tried to figure out a way to get them there from the Arabian Peninsula and over hill and through Dale. <laughs> they came across. And the Almoravids and the Almohads, and I do get them confused, I admit, one of those dynasties came up from so far south as to be in a place called Sijunmasa, which is down in uh, Tunisia, Nigeria, Tunisia um, Algeria, that area, and came up. So why in God's name would they be getting their culinary influences from the Arabian Peninsula if they're coming up from an area that is adjacent to a rice growing area, Other coastally. Other do you think the no, possibility of trade? Well, no, I think there is definitely a possibility and, and of trade. And also there's, I mean, some did come from the Arabian Peninsula. They probably came through. Ma um, even Madagascar or coming also in. Also from Persia. They, they, and, and coming they, into where? They came to Spain. Jews came to Spain from um, from uh, the Babylonia, from the, from the from Iraq, mm -hmm. and they but Arabs did too, and they brought with them. They were already eating rice then, and they brought that with them. So I, I think that all the influences Escabesh came from there. I know Escabesh they, came from Sibish. So I think that I, I think we're going to but get oh, no 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 we and and jambalaya that also mesh because uh, there are a lot of similarities. Well, I mean, I'm, I, as we said earlier and as we have continued to say, ain't nothing new under the right. sun. Yeah. But along with that, I think 
I'm not making or not attempting to make a case for this is the only way it happened. I'm trying to simply say few people acknowledge that that happened oh. at that, that, all. And I think that's absolutely right. And I think there's sometimes this, this urge, and we've, we've mentioned this before, this urge to find a big bang theory for every dish is, is nonsensical. And the fact is that people in similar circumstances with similar money or lack of money and sim similar ingredients are perfectly capable of creating similar dishes in different parts of the world. I'd, like, I'd love to move on, though, to because I think you, you can get bogged down in the origins of it. But what I think is very important is to look at its personal impact. And I, I'll talk about, again, the fish and chip dish. And I talked about it, uh, obviously, the, the Madeline moments. And I still remember going and you know, buying it with my father. And we'd drive up, and we'd stand in a line. If anyone's been to a proper British chippy, you stand in line while you order it. And the, if you're a kid, they give you a bag of what are called the scraps, all the extra scraps of batter, and you sit there with it, salt and vinegar. And it has a smell that, to me, just reminds me, the smell of uh, vinegar hitting fr uh, f thick fried potatoes, not, none of your wimpy French fry nonsense. There, you <laughs> God, for, God forgive you for that. But you, um, but you have your thick chip and your vinegar, and the smell immediately... Re recovers everything, and it's why it's one of the most important dishes to me, even though I've you know, been fortunate enough to eat everywhere or s as much as I can. So I'd love to know those that, 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 what made you choose it, apart from just Paula saying she'd like you to choose it, there's a reason why you agree to it. Why, th why is this dish important to you from a familial point of view, from a cultural point of view? Well, it, it really shows where Jews have gone. It's not a dish that I grew up with, particularly. However, I've studied it for years and years and years, and I found it fascinating that there are all these ingredients that came from different cultures, and um, just when the Jews moved, it was like a comfort food. And when you go into somebody's house and you smell that cholent, there's something slightly sweet about it mm -hmm. because they put some honey in it. Um, there might be some turmeric in one that's from hamim. So you know the origins of the cooks. And, um, and it's something that's used every week. So it seemed to me that it's a really good idea to have a traditional every week um, dish. Now, when you were talking about what other dishes um, came from there, um, lots of people say, uh, uh, what do you call it, baked beans came from Cholent, um, the cassoulet came from Cholent, that there, or hamim. Um, that during the Inquisition, people would come into homes, and if there was this pot stewing, um, they and th there was no pork in it, they would assume that they were Jews. So would this have a sorry to interrupt? Would this have a relationship to almost like halim as well in Pakistan and in northern India, which they would do with wheat and slow cook it and for a long time, and they eat that? And I'm wondering if the name has any connection. I well, it I, could. I don't I, know. I, 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 Something Don't look at me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Halim. <laughs> Got them. Got them. <laughs> um, but so to you, it's, is it one of those dishes that if you traveled in, uh, and someone once described the, the Latin mass to me like this, they said that wherever you went in the world, you could go into a church, they would start singing the Latin mass, and you were immediately you were at home. And that oh. one of the changes in the Latin mass, when they moved to doing them in you know, languages, yeah that you didn't immediately feel at home because you didn't understand what was going on apart from the ritual that you understood. But in Latin, you understood it everywhere. And is that something that people who went to, if they went to uh, have Sabbath in someone's house, that thing would make them feel part of that Jewish community? Absolutely. And, and, you, you know, and it started really at a time um, when many Jews would not light the fire at all on the Sabbath. Mm. So that you would cook this stew, and then you'd, it, you'd be in darkness during the, the night afterwards, and you couldn't cook anything, so that here was this slightly warm dish because it was still on the fire. But that's like fourth century. But then the things changed. They put it on a, first they would put it in the public oven throughout history, then they would put it in regular ovens. Sometimes they'd put it on like a blech, which was a cover to go on a gas burner, so that it, but, but the aroma is always there. And that's what's so wonderful about it. This, Beans cook for a long time. It's good, you know? And how about with you, Jambalaya, is this, again, just an interesting dish to talk about, or does it take on any you know, significance for you that you go, I have to talk about this? It, like, I have to talk about fish and chips. I have to. There's well, no other the choice. The significance for me, ironically, is musical. 
It's Hank Williams. Oh. <laughs> Jambalaya, crawfish pie, and a filet gumbo. Um, I got the record long before I knew the dish. And it was one of two records that came with my very first record player that was a, never mind, 78. Um, you know, the little kid record right. player. Oh, yeah. And it oh, was yeah. sort of scratchy record. For all of us the, here, but maybe uh, not this. The, <laughs> the flip side of, of it was a shrimp boat. So it was very much a Louisiana indoctrination. My family is not from Louisiana. I didn't know jambalaya until I was a way grown adult. I actually knew chebujen before I knew jambalaya. So chebujen would be the touchstone dish. And chebujen I learned on my first trip to Senegal, which was in 1972. Or as I like to say, BR before roots. Um, <laughs> and in 1972, I was doing research on my doctorate, which is on the French speaking theater of Senegal. And I went to Senegal and met a griot. I was with my mother. And in Senegal, there is an extraordinary world. There are several words, but one in Wolof is teranga. And teranga means welcome, hospitality. And we had just sort of crossed this man in the course of research, and he said, you must come to my house for lunch, because the big meal is lunch, not dinner. And so we went to his house. Uh, we were seated on this pristine tablecloth on the floor um, and presented with that communal bowl that we s talked about earlier. And that was my introduction to Senegal, mm. and that was my introduction to Chebujen. And now I've had any number of different kinds of chebujen, any number of different kinds of jambalayas, but that's the one that always remains first. The other experience was probably maybe 15 or 20 years after that, I was in Charleston, South Carolina, with a group of friends who ironically had all had Senegalese experience, lived in or worked in or knew the food of and had eaten in Senegal. And we were served, uh, you know, not a particularly pretentious or certainly not a white tablecloth restaurant, probably more of a tourist place. And they said, well, you want white rice or red rice? So we all said red rice. And we were sitting down, the dishes came, and we all looked up at each other and said, Chebujen. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, how those connections get made. It's, it, it really is fascinating, and particularly with Chebujem, because it is Senegal, I think, on a plate. It is. It, oh, absolutely. Just, I, I know we, we don't have too much time before we go to questions, but I would love to think about ongoing development. And one of the things we've talked about today a lot is, you know, kind of writing recipes and how they, we've talked about fusion and how dishes get altered. And are these dishes that continue to be developed, and is there a resistance against that? Because we're getting, and I think we're at, on the edge of a very exciting time in American history right now, partly because of the craft industry and partly because I think some of the best food right now is in the smaller cities, and, but also I think because we're getting the second and third generation of immigrants who are bringing their, their talents and traditions into the, the kind of US culinary vernacular. And are we seeing that with these dishes? Are there people doing new style, new, a, a um, new wave of cholent, or is it still very traditional? Oh, no, big time. Um, and what, what, how would that, yeah, tell me. All right, vegetarian chalant um, <laughs> with no garlic or no onions, depending on all these food allergies, um, putting quinoa in, um, all new kinds of vegetables. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable how it's changed. And, I have, and, and with the crock pots, I mean, it's, it's just, um, there, is a, there are people writing chalant cookbooks. You know, they're just... And, and also with second and third generation immigrants that really want to know what the truth is or what the original recipe, there is no original a recipe for most of these things because people have always been an immigrant population. There have been people that marry each other, look at you, from wherever, from different, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, your, your grandparents, oh, where yeah. they were from. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, we're not the only one talking about immigrants. No, it's, it's a constant story. I it's mean, a and it has constant, and it's, it manifests itself in the kitchen. <laughs> what? I said only for some people. 
Well, it's but more and more today than ever. No, no, I certainly understand that. But as Tony, wherever she is, said, I am not an immigrant in that traditional sense. Certainly oh, right, not in that. Right. But I think the movement no, right. of people around the world... Movement is a forced, different thing. Forced, forced migration is, is something It's very else. different, but has happened and taken traditions with it. And, and with, with Jambalaya, I know, because you know, wherever I go, in Louis, I'm not just in Louisiana, I'm seeing new varieties of that. And, and kind of, how do you feel about it? I mean, it's, it's a very emotional thing when a dish has an, an importance and a relationship Short with it. Shortcut, Jambalaya. Well, I mean, I 